Join me in prayer. Father, I thank you this morning for this time of worship. Now, Lord, as we come to open your word, Father, I repeat the words of the song. Father, would you fill me? May I be an instrument in your hands today as I share the message that you've placed on my heart to those of us who are here today. Pray that your Holy Spirit would come, Lord, and, and take this word, embed it deep in our hearts and in our conscience. Remind us today, Lord, of the God that we serve. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that the men in this place today, if they haven't already, would make some bold decisions, some courageous decisions, to stand in the midst of the struggle that we face today in our country and in our world. I pray in particular, Lord, for the young men who are here today. I pray, God, that today they would hear you speak to them clearly. For we need them. Their generation needs them. And I pray, God, that they would hear your voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me and go again to the Old Testament, the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. This is what uh, this text says. First, or Daniel chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You may be seated. As I continue to talk to the men about being bold and courageous, and to take a stand, I want to address this morning the younger men, and I know somebody's out there already thinking, define young. <laughs> I'll leave that for another day. But I want to talk to the young men, if I have studied correctly and read correctly, Daniel and his friends had to be very young in their teenage years, somewhere around there. Very, very, very young men. And you begin to wonder how in the world these boys right here could do what they did. When you look at the book of Daniel and you read about his strong stance, his prayer life, and the wisdom that he had the ability to think quick and to, and to process the information that he was receiving. To be able to look at the, the, the place where he had been taken and, and, and how they were to live and what was being asked of them. You, you wonder how in the world could these young men be that strong. I want to say to us a couple of things first before I get into what I want to share with you. Because I want to talk to you about four principles 
to keep that that'll keep you grounded. But folks, let me let me talk to our church in general. You know, sometimes we often question the commitment level or the dedication or the motive of our young people. We look at things like, well, do they have enough experience? Every time I hear that word, do they have enough experience, I think about that every single one of us in here at some point or another had to start something somewhere and you had zero experience. I laugh when I hear about the politicians who are running and point the finger at another politician and say he doesn't have the experience. And then I get to thinking about, well, I wonder how much experience George Washington had when he became the first president of the United States to become president of the United States. I wonder how much experience, I know they were military men, but I wonder how much experience they had in fighting the British. I know that sounds kind of funny, folks, but I, I sometimes wonder what our motive is in questioning the experience of certain people. Amen. I know that there are sometimes when we, when we pick leaders and choose some leaders that nobody thought they could ever be the kind of leader that they are, and all of a sudden they surprise you. Man. And so I want to say to us this morning... That we need to be careful that we don't cut out people that God wants to use just simply because they are young. And to you young people, I want to say this. If you do your homework, if you do what you're supposed to do and Sunday school and Bible study and attending church and learn the biblical basis for your life. If you do those things and you are obedient to God, you will have enough, as you're going to find out here in a minute, you will have enough to withstand any attack that comes at you from any direction if you're willing to trust God. I submit to you that Daniel was who he was because if you look at the names of these boys, there is a lot to say about what was in them. I hope you listen to me very carefully. The names that they have, their Hebrew names, say a lot about what was embedded in them, entrusted to them, taught to them. Obviously, we can tell this was a crucial time in their nation, taken into captivity, going to a place that they knew nothing about other than that they were the powerhouse of the day, and that perhaps God had allowed this to happen because of the backward direction that the nation had gone. By the way, it amazes, to, it amazes me how many times we talk about, and I hate to be harping on this thing, folks, but I, it amazes me how much we harp about what kind of experience we need to run our government and then I look at uh, what is the what is the debt now 20 trillion whatever that is I'd like to know how the experienced people with a whole lot of expertise got us where we are huh pretty interesting it's amazing to me how these Harvard, Stanford, Yale educated people don't have a clue about the very constitution that is our guiding document. I, I, I just, I don't, I don't know. Maybe because I don't have a, a degree from Yale. I don't know. I don't know the reason. I, I, I really don't. But, but it just amazes me how we sit on one hand and say these things and yet these are the very people who are taking us into the direction that we don't want to go. Yeah, amen. Right. 
I don't know, maybe I just don't have enough experience. <laughs> Daniel certainly had none. He was 14, 16 years old, somewhere in there. And he is faced with a king who has all of the experience in the world, battle-tested, fought hard, conquering, powerful nation, powerful army, all of these wise men that he had. How is it that Daniel could come to this point, listen to what was going to happen to them, and say, Sir, can I ask a question here? By all means, young man, what do you want to know? Would it be possible? Would it be okay with you if I don't defile myself with this? Can you imagine telling this guy, saying something like that, I, I, don't, I don't want to be defiled with that. That's, I don't know about you, but in today's society that would be offensive and it would hurt somebody's feelings. What do you mean you're, you don't like my food and my wine? I'm offended. But Daniel says, I don't want to drink that wine and I don't want to eat that food. In fact, if it doesn't bother you any, I, would, I have a better suggestion. Man. I think that if there would have been some older people there, about my age, they would have said, whose kid is this? You know? Would somebody tell that young whippersnapper to please sit down? and be quiet. It's bad enough that we're here and he's got the mitigated gall to tell them I don't want to eat the food. We may not even get to eat. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud. Pro probably none of that happened. I'm just saying pretty ridiculous to stand up there and tell these people uh, when they probably don't have to feed you I don't want your food. Kind of like the idea in our own schools when the children rebelled and said, I don't want that food either. It's good. I'm glad. Wasn't any good anyway. It's a bold young man. And his three friends. We know that if we look at Babylon, their three year training program was rigorous, tough, hard. Their whole intent in those three years was to completely wipe out any semblance, any recognition, any influence that they were bringing from their nation and their religion. It was Operation Wipe It Out. And it was intense. Find it amazing what you can get done in three years. I've always wondered why we have to go to college for four. Why can't they do it in two? I think it can be done, personally, for sure in three. It absolutely can get done. Just, you know, just like, just like our English uh, teachers that when we write a paper and, and, and you send it to the teacher and he or she comes back and, and, and just begins to just like mark, right? And you mark this out, mark that out, mark this out. What do they do? They're getting rid of all the fluff, all the junk, all the, all the no good words and so forth and so forth. And uh, when you, you thought you had a 10 page paper, you, you've got two pages. Well, I think there's a whole lot in our universities that could be wiped out. I mean, it just, it's just ridiculous what they teach people. There's a reason why, but anyway. I'm chasing the rabbit, so let me come back. This was to be a rigorous program to eradicate their God and their nation from their person. 
And I believe the reason that Daniel and his, these three men were able to stand is because of what is in their name. And I want to give you four principles, young men, that if you apply these to your life, you'll be able to stand and do the same. And men, we can do the same. In Daniel, we have a name that means God is my judge. And I want to start there. I want to talk for a second about the I am accountable principle. When Daniel looked at what was being offered to him and his friends in terms of the Babylonian program, Daniel quickly assessed the fact that that program was going to eradicate what he had been taught all of his life and he thought to himself, you know what, my name is, my name means God is my judge. In other words, what Daniel could possibly have been thinking was, one of these days I am going to face my God and I will be accountable to him for everything that I do. I don't know about you, but when I think about what I do in life and where I go in life and what I want to practice in life and what I want to teach in life and how I want to act in life, I think about this very fact. One of these days, I will stand at the judgment seat of Christ to give him an account for everything I did in my life as a believer. We are accountable to God. You are accountable to God. God will hold you accountable for everything that you do. One of these days, we're going to give God an account for everything that we do. I don't know about you, but for me, that's a motivator. That is a motivator. I don't want to have to stand before God. It's not a fear factor. It's just that I want to please my God. I want Him to be pleased in me. I want to hear from my God one of these days, Well done, thy faithful servant. That's what I want to hear, don't you? I want to hear that. It's not an issue of I'm afraid of my God. It's an issue of I want to please him. I want to honor him. I want to lift up his name and for him to be pleased in me and who I am. And young men, I want to tell you something right now. Make the decision. Young dads, make the decision right now that you want to please your God. You want him to be happy. You want him to be excited about you. You want him to know that you are faithful. Daniel thought, I am going to give my God an account for my life. You will give God an account for your life. Men, we are going to give God an account. No one is going to escape. We're accountable. When you get tempted... Think about this for a second, folks. Many of our students, our high school students, are about, if not graduated already, going to graduate. And we get all excited about where they're going to college. And I wish some of these young people would do a little bit better job of picking where they want to go. My brother, who graduated from Eastern New Mexico down the road several years ago, he and I were having a conversation about college and where my daughters wanted to go. And he's certainly one who, you know, he's done it himself, believes in, you know, getting an education. And, and, and that's important. But I remember one time he was talking to my daughter about where she was going to go and where she wanted to go. And he just, he made a point to her. He said, look. I've been teaching for X amount of years. And, and everywhere that I've interviewed, as long as, as, I, as, long as I did a good job, I, for, I, he said, I, I've gotten a job. And he said, no one has ever asked me no one has ever asked me or judged me about where I went to school. What they ask is, they want to make sure you're certified if you're going to be a teacher. 
She graduated from college, got a degree. You have the ability to do something, teach, you know. He said, I never had anybody question whether I had sufficient education just simply because I graduated from Eastern New Mexico. But we get so caught up on going to the, to the, to the to the most prestigious school when we know when we know that some of those institutions long ago have surrendered to everything ungodly but yet we want our children to have that piece of paper that says you fill in the blank You know what I'm going to tell, I, I, what I tell young people is listen. Go try to find the most godliest school that you can possibly find and go there. Who cares if it's out in the middle of nowhere, nobody knows where it is. God knows where it is. We know, we know in our nation that our young people are being subjected in, in, our, in our schools, in our universities, they are being subjected to all kinds of ungodly stuff. And yet, as long as they get that engineering degree, as long as they get that Master in business or whatever, as long as they get that. Man, even some of our own denominational colleges, sometimes I wonder. Daniel was bold because he knew that he was going to give God an account one day. Second principle. Daniel was able to be bold and his friends were bold because they understood this principle. Grace comes from God. Grace comes from God. The name Hananiah is God is gracious. God is gracious. The nation of Israel suffered captivity because of their disobedience. But yet in the midst of all of that, Daniel and his friends, God was gracious enough to save them. If you read the story, you realize that the king had his entire family murdered in front of him and then his eyes plucked out. And yet they were spared. Obviously for reasons. But yet they were spared. You know whose hand was involved in that? God's gracious hand was involved in that. Daniel spent an entire life in captivity with not one king, not two, but six. You imagine that? He outlasted the most wicked kings ever. All because he understood the principle that God is gracious. God will take care of you. God will provide for you. God will take care of you. God will do all those things. Listen, young, young fathers, young men. Listen, you trust God. Trust Him. He will see you through. 
Here's where I would say to you young men, young fathers, go talk to some of these men that you know that are godly and, 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 and have trusted God. Go sit down and ask them how God brought them through. We need each other. God is gracious enough. And Daniel knew that. No wonder, listen, no wonder he did what he did to protect what he knew. All of these things had been embedded in his life as a young child. Oh, young parents, listen to me very carefully. I... I hope that Redbud Baptist Church will always be a place that when, when you bring your children here, we will do everything in our power to make sure that to the best of our ability, we teach your young children the, the, the biblical principles of God's word in such a way that they, it, they, they learn it, it's instilled in them. But listen, there is no replacement for what you do in the home. Young parents, if I'm talking to you right now, dads, listen to me, young dads. Don't expect anyone else to do it. You do it. Alongside your wife, you teach your children. Tell them about God. Instill it. Let them see you studying God's word. Let them see you reading your Sunday school lesson. Let them see that those things are valuable. Just as my dad did when he read his Sunday school lesson and saw, I saw that every day of my life until I left the home. I watched him study his Bible. I watched him study the word of God. I watched him study his Sunday school lesson. I watched him go beyond what was there to try to get more depth into the word of God. I watched that all of my high school life, all of my life when he got saved, I watched that and I saw that made an impact in my life. Dad, let them see you doing it. And if you haven't started, start now. Sit down with your children and tell them, listen, I know I haven't always done this, but I'm today, I'm making a decision, I'm going to do it right now. It's, it's not too late. God is gracious. He will bless that. He will take care of you. The great God, grace comes from God principle. But there's another one. And that is that God is sufficient principle. Mishael's name is who is like God? There's no other. The reason Dan Daniel could be so bold was because when he heard the name he was going to be given, when he heard the names of the other gods that they were going to be given, when he understood that, when he knew that, he understood, wait a minute. You can try to change my name, but I'm telling you something right now. None of those gods are sufficient. I don't even know them and I don't even care to know them. Because I'm here to tell you that I have hundreds of years of history of watching my God do the greatest things. Like take my nation out of the slavery of Egypt and on and on. I've heard all of those things. There is no God like my God. In fact, the other nations who have taken us into captivity have all admitted at one time or another there is no God like the God of the Hebrews. Hebrews. There is no God like that. Pharaoh had to bow and say, there is no other God except that one. Amen. And what we need to do, young men and fathers of this age and, and time, is to say to the world, to the government, to these people, and say, listen, you can make fun of me all you want. You can ridicule me. You can stand and ridicule, but I will tell you, I don't care how many times, you cannot, will not find any other God like my God. I don't care if you don't even believe in him. He is there. I know because he changed me. I know what he's done in me. God is real. God is sufficient. Man, look at the history of this nation. We can talk a lot of things about this nation, but there is one thing that is undeniable. 
And that is that from its inception to now, even though there are more who reject him now than there was back then. But even from its inception to now, God has been sufficient for this nation. That's why we are who we are. That's why we have been as powerful as we are. That's why we have been as great as we are. It's because there were plenty of people who said, God is our God, no other God. He is the one that we worship. We will worship no other. Up until now, that has always been true in our nation. They can discuss it, they can have a conversation about it, they can do whatever they want to, but they cannot deny the fact that God has blessed this nation like no other. And if God can do that for a nation, dad, young dad, young man, God can do that for you. God can take care of you. Daniel was bold because he knew that God was sufficient. There's the last one. The reliable principle. Azariah means God is my help. When Daniel said, I don't want your food and I don't want your wine, what he was saying is I will trust the provisions that God has made I will eat the food that God said that we ought to eat I will do the things that God asked us to do because I have seen it with my own eyes that God is reliable God is my help listen young man when you get into trouble, when you find yourself struggling, when you find yourself in a challenge, when you find yourself surrounded by the ungodly telling you to abandon God, if you have inside of you embedded the principle that God is reliable, you will be bold enough to say, I know what you're saying, I understand what you're thinking, but listen, I trust my God, He will come through for me. Every single one of us who claim to be Christian in this church right now can attest to the fact if we took the time, we probably wouldn't get out of here until 6 o'clock. But I'm telling you that every single one of us in here, if we took about 30 seconds to say how God has been reliable in your life, we'd be here forever. How God has been reliable in your life. Tell me that isn't so. You've seen the reliability of God come through when your business was struggling, when it was beginning. You've seen the reliability of God when your farm was struggling, when there was a drought. You've seen the reliability of God when you were, were beginning something or whatever. We all can attest. You can attest. Listen, I wish there were more times in our churches when we could just give a witness. Because our young people need to hear the stories. Listen to me very carefully. Have you ever heard of a man by the name of George Mueller? James Hudson Taylor. Not this James Taylor. The other one. Let me tell you a couple of stories. I think this one is James Hudson Taylor. They were in a ship headed, I think, to China. <clears throat> and he noticed that the captain was troubled. And he, they asked why, and he said, well, our ship is headed for that reef over there and we've done all that we can and there's nothing else that we can do and we're drifting toward that island and that island is full of cannibals. I don't know about you but at this point I'd rather drown than wind up over there. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, you know, if you have a choice, I, I'm drowning. And the captain had given up and said you might, we might as well just prepare I don't know about you, but the idea of being eaten doesn't sound very good, you know. Uh, 
Anyway, he said, wait a minute. He said, no. There are, there are four Christians in here. We're going we're gonna to retire to our room and we're going to go pray and ask God to be in a breeze and move the ship in a different direction. Well, the captain surely didn't believe that, but they did. Then they came back up and still headed in the wrong direction. Captain still decided he, it was too late. He said, we're just going to quit. He said, you will do none of the kind. He said, look. He said, you, you, you change the direction of that mass. Look at, and, and there, there's a breeze coming. It's begin, and the, and, the, and the, the, the mass began to move. And it, it, you could see it beginning to flicker. And all of a sudden, the right breeze at the right time begin to push the, the, the ship back out into sea where it belonged. And before you knew it, they were out of danger. If you've read the story of George Mueller, you understand that he had orphanages in Bristol, England. I think that's how you pronounce it. And he will... You, if you read a story, you'll realize that there was never a time when any of his kids ever missed a meal, even when it looked like they were not going to eat. If I understand his story correctly, or if I've heard correctly, he always trusted God for provision. And he prayed that God would provide. And he, will t he would tell you himself that God was reliable every single time. You know, I wonder, young men, older men, men today, I wonder, I'm sure there are somewhere out there, I try to be anyway, but I wonder why we don't hear of such men like that today. Something interesting about most of these men <clears throat> is this. When some of those stories occurred to these men, they were very young. Some of them were in their 20s. They learned early to trust God. They learned early to believe that God was sufficient. They learned early in life that God is reliable. They learned early in life that they were going to give God an account. Listen to me, men. You can be bold and you can be courageous. But you won't be those things if principles like these are not in your life. And the only way to get those principles in your life is if you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way. Only a mighty God can do that. I know this, that in this room setting right here, right now, there are men, and I'm talking to you, there are several of us maybe who are facing some, some, some challenges, whether it's very private, personal, or family issues or something. We're facing some things that require some very, a powerful moving of God. And I'm telling you right now, if you will rely on Him and trust like Daniel did in these principles, He will send an answer. It may be food at the last minute like George Mueller. It may be a breeze right at the last second, like Hudson Taylor or any of these others, but he will come through. I know that there are people in this room right now, you've never, ever been as worried about your nation as you are right now. I've never seen so much worry, concern, like I see it today. Never seen it that rough. And I'm telling you right now, 
that if our army and our military is as weak as they say it is, I'm not so sure about that, but if it is, we certainly know that we're not getting any help from our government. There's only one answer. God. And some of us men right now need to make the decision that we're going to trust God. Men, I want to challenge you. Young men, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to go out to your backyard, to your farm, back behind a shed in your business somewhere. I don't care where. Maybe the park right in the middle of your neighborhood. I don't know. I'm asking you, as your pastor, I'm asking you to go get before God on your knees standing up. I don't care how you do it. But we need to go out and we need to cry out to God. This is not the time to be Mr. Macho, Mr. Brave, Mr. Whatever. Hallelujah. This is a time to say, God, I can't, we can't, we haven't proven ourselves reliable, but you are reliable. I'm crying out and calling out to you. I want to tell you something, men, the greatest men in the Bible were men who wept before God because of what was going on. And so don't you dare... Don't you dare think that it is unmanly to cry out before God and bow before God and weep before him. You fall into that trap and that lie and Satan will, will, will get rid of you. We need some men who will bow before God and say, God, I can't. If you've never surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, would you do it today? Men, will you stand up and be a bold and courageous man right there where you are? Would you do it? This country is desperate for men leaders. Desperate. And maybe you're the man. Young men, you're in here, you're about 14, 15, 16, 17, 20, whatever. Did the, did, has the thought occurred to you that possibly God might be looking at you? Maybe you're the man. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes right there. Right there where you are, just bow your head, close your eyes. <clears throat> Men, I'm asking you to make a decision. Some of you have already. I've spoken to some of you and some of you are, I hear what you're doing. I hear how you're praying. But some of you need to make a decision today. Father, I come before you at this moment and at this hour. I don't know from where <clears throat> and I don't know from what corner of this place Lord and I don't know who but Father I pray that there is a man in this place there is a young man in this place who has made the decision that they're going to trust you because you're reliable believe in you because you're gracious Trust in you because you're sufficient. And live a life knowing that we are accountable to you. I pray that you raise them up. I pray, God, that you raise up men who are prayer warriors in this place. And if there's someone here today who's never given their life to Jesus Christ, never surrendered. Father, would you bring them to the feet of Jesus Christ so that they can lead their family in the right direction. 
I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?